Welcome to Chicago Founders Stories here at 1871, Chicago's digital startup hub here on Chicago Founders TV. Have with me tonight Mike Sands, the co-founder of Signal. Welcome, Mike. Glad Thank to have you. Thank you. Good to be here. So, um, Mike, a lot of people have heard about Signal, heard it's an exciting company, know you've yeah. had great growth, but um, a lot of people might not know exactly what you do. How, sure. For the uninitiated, how would you describe what, what Signal does? So uh, we're the technology that helps power people-based marketing. So the big trend in marketing today is obviously to use technology to get the right message to the right person at the right time. And in order to do that, you have to be able to connect the identity of a customer and their underlying data, their intentions, they want to buy a car, they want to go shopping, across the channels that they're interacting with. In your life and my digital life are very complex now. We have cell phones and laptops and iPads and emails, and all of that digital you is hard to connect. We're the infrastructure that allows brands to connect your digital life to their marketing needs. Got it. And it was originally called Bright Tag, correct? It's originally uh, called Bright Tag, and we created Signal about uh, three years ago to represent the expanded uh, charter that we have as a company. And it's Signal, the bright tag idea was originally to do with tags. What kind of, can you explain for the layperson what those tags were, what kind of tags they are? So data collection in general is a big need in uh, online marketing today. So there are needs across the industry to serve administratively those data collection needs, which is the original focus of the company. And what we do today is provide that administrative function as a way to initially engage with customers. And about 30,000 uh, companies across the world today use that original part of our platform wow. to manage their uh, administrative needs for deploying their technology solutions, connecting with their customers, and ingesting their first party data. Signal, the evolution of that same platform, is really addressing the higher need in the industry to power the marketing that connects to the consumer, not just the underlying deployment and connectivity layer. Got it. Well, it's exciting. We had an exciting story tonight, but uh, we always like to go back in time and start. So, so Mike, talk about where you grew up. You're from the Midwest originally. That's right. I grew up in Indiana, and uh, I'm the son of an entrepreneur, and my grandfather was an entrepreneur. Uh, I was just laughing with, with my, uh, my dad, my my, uh, my grandfather uh, invented, because everything needs to be invented by somebody, the metal bed frame. So if you oh. go to Mattress World and see the little square rectangular metal thing that the mattress fits in with the little hooks at the end, he had the patent on that. Wow. Which was an awesome business for 17 years. But at 17 <laughs> years in one day, it was not such a great business. Uh, uh, but, but the roots of entrepreneurialism run deep in fact, the three co-founders of Signal, we realized that all of our dads uh, also founded their own companies. Wow. And and what, did, what did your dad do? Uh, he founded a, uh, a sales company. So he sold consumer electronics. He was a uh, represented a variety of lines. He literally, I finally convinced him to retire. Uh, he closed his company down after 45 years, about wow. a month ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. How's he doing one month off? Okay, so my dad loves to work. What a surprise. Anybody that knows me would be very surprised by that. Any guy who had a business for 45 years has to love to work. Yeah, love so, what he does. So seven days a week. And uh, so, so when he retired, he's you know, pushing 80. Uh, he did what any 80-year-old would do upon retirement. He went and got his lifeguarding license. <laughs> so, uh, so he is now a, a, a lifeguard pretty much full time because he couldn't actually not have something to do. <laughs> where, does he, where does he live? Uh, uh, he lives in Indianapolis. He's moving up to, uh, to be with my sister, my mom, and, and, and dad uh, in a couple months up in Minneapolis. Oh, wow. And uh, it splits his time between the JCC and the YMCA lifeguarding now. Oh, really? Absolutely. Oh, and he hilarious. will probably... So we found, uh, we Googled oldest living lifeguard, and it's, 80, <laughs> and it's, and it's 88 years old. Nice. So we did a throwdown and said, nice. you got to go until you're 89. That's awesome. What we don't know is whether they make waterproof uh, hearing aids. <laughs> but assuming that they do, I think that he's going to be good for a long time. Uh, that's great. That's great. Well, this, so talk about your, you growing up. You grew up around entrepreneurs. Um, what were you like as a kid? What you, would you like to do? I like to work. Um, so, uh, uh, it, you know, a lot of us have stories, you know, newspaper route, whatnot. 
uh, I fell in uh, with a museum in Indianapolis. Uh, the Indianapolis Children's Museum is the largest children's oriented museum in the world. It's got about 500,000 square feet of exhibit space. It's really a, uh, an amazing organization. They had a natural history department, hundreds of animals and plants. It was really a great place to grow up. And so I'd volunteer there every uh, weekend and uh, every day during the summer. And eventually that turned into a job. Uh, and I worked there for 10 years while wow. uh, uh, growing up. Wow. So uh, you're, and you grew up in Indianapolis? Yeah. So you're in Indianapolis and you're looking at Before college. the tech boom there. Yes. So I mean, now I look at Indianapolis and it's this amazing place with exact Target right. and Angie's List and, and uh, any number of other uh, startups. It wasn't so much then, but it just really come around. Yeah, no, it's exciting. So um, you decide to come to school up at Northwestern. Yep. Brings you to Chicago, the Chicago area. Talk a little bit about why Northwestern, your Northwestern experience, what what you studied, what you liked doing, you know, what, what was Mike Sands like in, at that time? Uh, you, you know, I loved my time at Northwestern. I'd love to tell you that it was some big calculated plan to go to NU, but a lot of my friends uh, from the year ahead of me, uh, you know, three or four folks ended up going to Northwestern. And uh, Chicago is always that big city that kids from Indianapolis would ride the school bus up to and take a field trip once or twice a year. Uh, so it just seemed very appealing to me to, to go to Northwestern, great school in a great city. Uh, and I've been here ever since. So, uh, you, but you, didn't, you weren't in technology, you majored in communications. Yeah, absolutely. I loved my communications degree. I knew from very early on in my time at Northwestern that I wanted to go into marketing. Uh, I met some very uh, influential folks that were actually at Kellogg at the time that had come out of marketing and advertising backgrounds. And I realized very early on that I had a real passion for that. Uh, and the closest thing that Northwestern had to a marketing degree was to go into the communications program. And so that's what I did. So you become a, then you graduate and become a later day Don Draper. Uh, right, exactly. <laughs> Leo I'm Burnett, sure. here I come. <laughs> I'm sure it's not quite as, uh, it's not as sexy as, it, yeah. as, as the show. Um, but you go to Leo Burnett when you get out. and. Um, Talk a little bit about, in a, in a bit of serendipity, you had United Airlines, I guess, was one of your yeah, big clients, right? Yep. So um, first of all, did you, were you attracted to travel back then? No, but there's this strange recurring theme throughout my career, you know, uh, travel, right. uh, whether four wheels or flight. <laughs> and uh, uh, look, what's there not to love about travel? You know, everybody does it. Everybody's got an opinion. As a marketer, uh, I think that you want to be able to take to market things that people are highly engaged with. Mm -hmm. And I really admire, you know, running a B2B company right now, I admire the brilliant B2B marketers because it's hard to humanize a product that you're selling to other companies. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to humanize and engage with people that are flying an airline. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was at the heyday uh, in, back in the 90s of, of United Airlines advertising. And, the Rhapsody in Blue campaign and some of the most brilliant advertising that had been put on film. But what was really neat about the industry was that it was just starting to sense the change that technology could bring. Hmm. So Leo Burnett had an inside uh, digital agency called Giant Step at the time that actually turned into a, a really successful. What, what, what year was this? Uh, so this would have been 84, uh, 94, excuse wow. me. Wow, so yeah. very, 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 early. very early. Uh, and uh, there's some very visionary people at United Airlines that could sense the coming sea change the technology would bring. And uh, I was very lucky enough to work with them uh, and with the Giant Step team at Leo Burnett to launch the very first website that United mm -hmm. Airlines ever had. Uh, and most people don't know that that was a, a product of uh, the Leo Burnett company and not of a big you know, digital shop. Interesting, yeah. interesting. So what'd you learn early on being in one of the early big web uh, uh, presences like that? You know, I, I realized, this, so this was so early that, you know, uh, it, it was this all dial-up modems. You couldn't buy anything on the website. It was purely for informational purposes. But people could see out ahead of this, uh, this curve and this coming sea change. So. When I left Leo Burnett to go to General Motors and flip to the client side and run uh, vehicle brand advertising for Osmobile, I, I, I brought a mindset 
uh, to that job that technology could play a role. So no young person would set foot in an Oldsmobile, they, you know, <laughs> right? You wouldn't, no. I wouldn't. But General Motors had just invested uh, about $10 billion in completely redoing the line of vehicles. We had the Aurora, the Intrigue, the Alero. These were cutting edge, really great products. And we had data that said if we could get somebody actually behind the wheel of one of these cars. Are you the guy behind this is not your father's old school? No, that came before me. That's, uh, that's Neil, and he's a brilliant, brilliant marketer. That was, a, that was a famous campaign where- That was before the 10 billion in investment ah. on the new vehicles. It was, it was just, it was off by five All years. All sizzle, no steak. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. Um, but one of so the most famous campaigns ever, I yeah. was the guy that came after that. And so, <laughs> so what was it? I was the guy that did the campaign after the most famous campaign in advertising. Yes, that's what uh, uh, a friend of mine So says. we had to do something else. A friend of mine who has Barack Obama's old Senate seat, he's like, oh, I have the former <laughs> president's Senate seat. And people are like, U.S. Senate seat? No, state Senate seat. It's like, but it's the most important Senate seat in the country. Right, because exactly. Because presidents. Vote for uh, me. So, so, uh, so we had this insight. If we could get somebody behind the wheel that, that one-third of them, we could actually, the dealers could close. So the whole idea was a test drive. But the only way that we could get somebody to pay attention to the brand was to engage with them online. And because uh, it was a new medium. And what year, what years are, are this? So this was uh, 97, 98, 99. Uh, and internet advertising was just getting invented. Right. So in 96 and 97, if you wanted to buy the internet, you could call up Dave Karnstedt, who was the head of sales at hotwired.com. Uh, and that was the single banner ad on the internet to buy at the time. So you could buy the whole internet by calling Dave. Uh, and you know, you fast forward 20 years and things are obviously very, very different. But back then, we had to invent all of this uh, as it came. So Google didn't exist. Uh, you know, Lycos and Excite were really big. Uh, but we came up with the idea that an online lead generation program, you know, the stuff that's very standard today, could actually start to revolutionize the way that the so, dealers so how, engage how did with you, their how customers. How did you make that work in the early days you know, with uh, the dynamics of the internet at that point? You know, I had uh, an amazing team, so I turned around and I hired the old team that I was part of uh, at Giant Step and Leo Burnett, uh, and they really helped us to drive uh, a level of engagement across these platforms. Now, it was very digestible at the time. You didn't have to make that many phone calls. There were maybe 15 or 20 big players on the internet, and you could lock all those up. Uh, and that level of invention and entrepreneurialism that uh, I think we had and I found inside the folks at United Airlines that wanted to launch their first website. We found at General Motors, interestingly, that wanted to innovate digitally and start to engage with their customers in new ways. Did everybody want to do it? No, but I think that there's a lesson about being an entrepreneur in a big company mm -hmm. that uh, is absolutely true. Uh, and even in companies as large as the General Motors at the well, time, and you not could just, be entrepreneurial. But let, me, let, let me ask you about that because it's not just a big company. General Motors is a not only a big company, but it's famously one of the most bureaucratic companies of the large sure. scale companies. I mean, it's you know part of the whole post um, post uh, bankruptcy restructure was right. cultural. So it must have. It's interesting to think of before all that happened, trying to be entrepreneurial. How did you navigate that? How did you? How did you make that happen in a place that, that wasn't necessarily the heritage for, for quite a while? Sure. It, one of the most interesting things that GM did at the time, and actually the way that I got to GM, uh, is that they had some visionary leadership at the time in the marketing organization that said, let's bring in people from the outside that didn't grow up from within General Motors to be change agents. And so they hired uh, a brand manager and a head of advertising right. for each division. At some point they hired the Bausch and Lomb guy, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so so uh, Zarella, this was his idea. Hmm. Uh, and he brought us in as change agents. Um, but ultimately, within any big company, there are amazingly brilliant, passionate people that want to try new things. Not everybody. Uh, but you just have to find enough and be given enough you know, so managerial. The, so the marketing organization was more entrepreneurial. I, I think absolutely. I mean, remember that, that General Motors 
uh, you know, they did some amazing things. They were some of the, the first folks to sponsor the Olympics and, and try uh, to innovate in new and different ways. Procter & Gamble, you know, throughout their history has been very innovative with, with marketing as well. And these are huge companies, but they have a lot of budget. Right. And I think that they're willing to experiment. If you set aside 1% of the General Motors marketing budget to experiment, it's a lot of money. Right. Well, I love your optimism and the fact that you're able to navigate this because it's interesting. I mean, United and General Motors, these two companies ended up going bankrupt. And, you know, they had a lot of baggage that they had to sort of work through. But you found... So I, so I was late to the table. I was five years after the great advertising campaign, and then both of my companies went bankrupt. Not when you were there. Though, oh, so. yeah, that's true. That's <laughs> no, true. but, I, but, it's, but it, it says a lot, and I think this is important, yeah. because um, I've known a lot of people at both companies who, who wouldn't have had described their experience the same. So it says something about your instincts to be an entrepreneur yeah. and to be innovative and try and drive change, because if you take 10 random people out of those two companies in the era before they went bankrupt, Entrepreneurship would not be the first word or the first 10 words you might hear. So it's interesting that out of General Motors, you leave the big company world kind of forever until Signal becomes a giant GM-sized behemoth. Um, and you, you go to do a startup. You go to a, early, a startup that's just starting to grow, that's just getting going. That's right. Um, that's right. Because not a lot of people have left those organizations to, be, to do what you've done. Sure. And so I think it, it's important for people who, you know, you make it sound easy to understand yeah. that that's, you know, that. That's something that really defines you, I think, is uh, very different and probably was a signal, no pun intended, of what of, of yeah. what you were meant to do. So you talk about going to Orbitz, and if you can, a lot of people here would know Orbitz, of course, as a famous consumer site, a right. great success right. story, a recent billion-dollar sale. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people don't know the birth story of Orbitz. Sure. And you know, share that, because I think the birth story of Orbitz is something that is important to the trajectory of Orbitz that a lot of people and might important to Chicago. Very. Yeah. So Orbitz uh, was uh, an amazing success. Uh, and it was founded at the time uh, by five airlines. And in fact, the original name for the company was Dunkel. Dunkel. We, Dunkel. Delta United Northwest Continental LLC. And so we all had email addresses. No wonder they yeah, had to Mike, hire a marketer. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, Mike at Dunkel.com. A lot of low-hanging fruit yeah, when you got there, totally. Mike. But that was on the quiz that we gave to new employees on the history of the company. Um, so, so the airlines came together, and they saw something in the market that um, excited them but also made them very nervous, and that was the growth of online travel agencies. They looked at Expedia and Priceline and Travelocity as real disruptors in the market, and they said, look, we, we can either join them, we can have an alternative, uh, or we might be uh, experiencing some risk to our core business model over time and erosion. So let's uh, come together and fund a startup that can provide a viable and alternative. In the beginning, in the were they all equal investors and shareholders? Yeah. Yep. And uh, this was an unusual startup because the, the total capital committed was you know, well in excess of $200 million. And the, to be clear, it uh, must have been interesting to navigate the Justice Department saying you would do this too. So, so there's a great marketing story in that. So I was lucky enough to um, run the marketing organization through the launch of the company and its growth trajectory to, to IPO. Uh, and, uh, and I always talk about the fact that uh, we, uh, we experienced a great lift because the Justice Department and all the state's attorneys general came after us. And the headlines in the newspaper read, Orbit's investigated for unfairly low prices. <laughs> awesome! Well, you are a good market. I mean, like, could you imagine a better set of marketing headlines than that? And so consumers are like, hey, you know, that's great. Let's go try that out. Um, and, and we had one of those moments when we launched the company. We launched the company, I think, on June 4th. Uh, it was of 2001. And I believe that on our first day, we had 15,000 transactions. Wow. Or some crazy number like that. So go, go back for it. So the airlines come together. Had they come together? Was Sabre originally jointly so owned? Uh, so, uh, so Sabre uh, is a booking engine, a booking right. uh, GDS that uh, we would connect to mm -hmm. uh, along with the other uh, GDS systems. And that's where the tickets would get driven. If you bought a ticket, it. it would end up in Sabre or WorldSpan. 
uh, or Apollo. So how, how, did, how did they find you, or how did you find them? You know, I got a call from a, a, a recruiter that said, we're putting together this really interesting company. And, you know, I had uh, my eye on moving back from General Motors to Chicago. And what an amazing opportunity to join this great team. They had, had a, uh, hired a visionary CEO, uh, Jeff Katz, that had uh, just come from being a CEO of Swiss Air, and before that had actually run Sabre. Uh, so he was an incredibly successful CEO. They were putting together a great team, and they were obviously really well capitalized, but most importantly, uh, they were solving an important problem in the market, and they had a differentiated product. Now, and how did you hindsight being how did, 2020. How did, how did you differentiate the product? Because it's, you know, that's in so, the early days, yeah. wouldn't be obvious to a consumer how you differentiate. What was so, the secret? So back in 99, 2000, if you went online, the airline websites had slightly discounted pricing. They had web fares that were only available on their sites, not available on Expedia, Priceline, Travelocity, and the others. We got exclusive access to those discounted tickets in exchange for uh, more favorable economics back to the airlines in terms of the commissions that we would pay them. Interesting. So I want to take this for a second, and we talked about something earlier, which I'd like to get yeah. to in a minute, but I want to, you know, first, one of the things we talk about marketplaces at Chicago Ventures, we talk a lot about you know, marketplace. Everybody wants to be, well, everybody today wants to be a platform, but sure. they used to want to be a marketplace, which is a form of platform. And one of the things that's interesting in a platform is a lot of people want to be platforms and businesses that have tremendous supplier concentration. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, you don't see a lot of those work. Um, Talk a little bit about the dynamics, because it's interesting. You see, I think Orbitz ended up with having some uh, little battles with some of the airlines yeah. more recently. Yeah, talk yeah that's true. Talk yeah. about, not, not in the founding day, but now this is for people out there who are thinking, okay, Mike's been involved in great marketplace companies. Um, you know, it sounds great to go do. Of course, you guys did have an advantage having the airlines be your original partners. Right. Talk about the pros and the cons, because it's easy to see the pros, it may yeah. not be obvious to see the cons, of trying to do a two-sided marketplace um, with tremendous supplier concentration. Because I think a lot of people underestimate that it's, it's yeah. not, it doesn't just run one way. It's not yeah. just a, a windfall. Yeah, I, I think to travel uh, is, is, is interesting, because there's certainly the vast majority of consumers don't travel that often. You know, maybe. 2.5, three times a year. And maybe, you know, an Orbitz or an Expedia can go fight for one or two of those transactions. But the, the, the level of loyalty that most consumers exhibit toward travel is pretty low. And so in a marketplace, you're, you're sort of perfecting on that, that, that problem, which is it's highly elastic demand. And so the airlines all on the back end, not inside Orbitz, but the prices that Orbitz displayed are a direct artifact of some really, really sophisticated revenue management uh, teams within the airlines that uh, are trying to perfect the pricing mm -hmm. that they display on the Orbit site relative to their own website, how they engage with their frequent flyers uh, and whatnot. What I think that Orbitz did very, very uniquely Early on, we had some very visionary technologists led by Alex Zoglin, who's still active. In fact, he's the CTO at Hyatt uh, today. But Eric was a, 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 Alex was a serial entrepreneur, an amazing technologist, attracted a great group of technologists around them. And they aligned themselves with a group of scientists from MIT hmm. that had founded a company called ITA Software. Mm -hmm. And between the two of them, they found a way to put that grid of airline choices at the top of an orbit search result. Now, the grid thing is now used on every website that displays travel options from Kayak to Expedia to Priceline. Everybody says, here's the market in an easy to view, kind of one shot, uh, view of the marketplace. That didn't exist until hmm. Alex and the ITA team invented it. So this is an int interesting one. For those of you who don't know, ITA is a company that was sold to Google a couple years yep. ago, I think for $675 yep. million or something like yep. that. 
uh, incredible success story backed by General Catalyst out of MIT. Um, but there's an interesting question that you hear um, venture capitalists and founders ask, which is, ITA was the Intel inside right. for all these online travel agents and had a great business, great mm -hmm. data, ended up selling to Google, as I understand it, because Google didn't want anybody else to be able to own them. Um, but at this end, the Justice Department, of course, put huge restrictions on what Google could do with their data and make sure everybody could have it. It was so valuable. They still have access to it. Yeah, yeah. It was so valuable that they basically could only buy them, even though they weren't in that business. Right. It's They're, essentially an industry asset. Incredibly successful B2B story, data-centric, you know, makes a lot of sense. Sells for $675 million. Yeah. A fellow Northwestern alum, a Kellogg alum, Steve Hafner, who you worked with yeah. at Orbis, yeah. starts a company called Kayak and sells yeah. for $1.9 billion. Right. One does B2B, powers the entire industry. One does B2C and is really competing with the rest of it. Um, if you read the sort of blue ocean, red ocean type books, you'd say ITA is in a blue ocean and Kayak was in theory in a red ocean. But if you look at the outcomes and right. returns, they're an order of magnitude different. Um, what, what do you think, is there, is there a generalizable insight or any sort of broader insight an entrepreneur could take as you think about, because should I go take an innovation or technology B2C or B2B yeah. or, or anything that you could share that might be insightful to people who have innovations and don't know which direction to go. Sure. So, I, so first of all, Steve uh, Hafner, who founded Kayak and came out of, of Orbitz, you know, two-time amazingly successful entrepreneur, and and you know, to basically, he was maybe the first business employee at Orbitz. He was even earlier because he was part of the the consulting organization. Uh, BCG that helped put the original business plan together for mm. Orbit. So he was early, early, along with Alex Zoglin in founding the company. Uh, and a brilliant success at Orbitz and a brilliant success again at Kayak. I think that the theme there, because Orbit sold five times for a billion dollars plus. <laughs> so, yes, uh, it has. Uh, it, it, you know, it's been public, two IPOs. Private. Yeah. Public, private, public, private. More than any time, company in Chicago right, in that time. Every time for over a billion dollars. Right. So if you look at the enterprise value created by Orbitz or by Kayak relative to ITA, and to me, my initial you know, quick thought back to you is, if you're a, B, a very successful B2C company, if you have that level of customer engagement, that's really, really precious and rare. Uh, and that is frankly, different than uh, a pure software play. It just is. And you know, we can you know, stomp our feet on the ground as software people and say that's not fair, but that's reality. At the end of the day, an investor or an acquirer is going to pay not only for the great technology that a Kayak or an Orbitz had, but for that level of customer engagement that they and Is there an well. insight that you think came out of the original Orbitz experience? I know it's had a lot of different yeah. incarnations of management teams through all the IPOs and sales and like, but are, is there an insight you think that Steve had that allowed yeah, them to, to get the cheap? I think that Steve understood the power of transparency <laughs> and that what consumers really want at the end of the day and what the internet's all about is creating transparency and openness. And so Orbitz in its original incarnation, that grid thing that gave you pricing from all the airlines and all your travel options for your route in one easy to find snapshot was radical transparency. Yeah, right. And consumers loved it. You know, we were selling 100,000 airline tickets so a could day. could it be done better? I but mean, could it be done better and that's where Steve said, you know what? With Kayak, we can actually go one step beyond. So rather than just taking the search results from one search platform like Orbitz, what if we actually aggregated the searches of the searchers? And he founded the whole concept around meta search engines, which Kayak became. So he had the insight around radical transparency. He saw it play out at Orbitz. And he said, well, now what if I aggregate all the aggregators? Did the Orbitz people ever mind that? We, uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, helping a competitor? No, 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 I was, we, we did a deal with Steve to give him access to the data. Our only mistake was not asking for warrants in the company. Uh, no, he's, he, uh, he obviously partnered with us very early on, 
Orbis got tremendous benefit back from Kayak because Kayak ended up driving tremendous traffic to the site. Remember that the, the, the main way that, that these sites used to get traffic, other than people self-directing to Orbitz, was through a, a platform like Google. Well, you know, the rise of the machines, people like Orbitz were perfecting how they bid. The ability to drive profitable tra uh, traffic was changing ra rapidly. Interesting. And Steve provided all of our platforms with a new source of traffic that was incredibly valuable. Interesting. Um, along that line, um, one of the interesting things about, um, you know, Or Orbitz has had challenges periodically back and forth with the airlines. Mm -hmm. um, Orbitz came in at a time, and everybody's had this, it's, it's the tension in the yeah. marketplace, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but I'm interested, one of the things that I think is fascinating about the Orbit story is, is that the space was already pretty well occupied in the mind share. It wasn't right. Like, we were the 25th mover, you know. Right. Uh, you don't learn that in business school. Like, go be the 25th mover exactly. in the category. So, yeah. so what allowed you to break, break through the clutter? What allowed you to break through the clutter there, do you think? So I, I don't, uh, it is funny, you know, we used to talk about this around the office, like we're, we're last, not first, in terms <laughs> of entering the market. And I guess maybe there's some brilliance to being first and there's some brilliance to being last, because you can sit back and observe those gaps in the market and those needs and then dive in you know, the, to whatever that wedge issue is and create your own market space for that, where if you're the fifth mover in a market, maybe you miss the initial wave, but you're not late enough to find your own white space to build a business. Um, so I don't think there's any science to that. We didn't, you know, we didn't wake up one day and go, let's be 25th mover. Uh, I think that the people like Steve and Alex and the airlines that, that founded it were addressing a market need. But what they did do is they said, because we're the 25th mover, let's make sure that what we do is intentionally differentiated. So back to the differentiated pricing, the differentiated technology, the differentiated display. Even the way we marketed the company was different. You know, we launched the company online. Now, I know you're like, well, doesn't everybody do that? But you know, this was, 2001, right. web traffic was very light. Uh, the number one travel site ranked in ComScore was MapQuest. Uh, so times were very, very different. The idea that you wouldn't launch a web-based e-commerce company using television and magazines was really weird and radical right. to folks. Uh, but it became an incredibly successful strategy for us. Uh, the other thing that you can't uh, anticipate as you launch a company are these events that come out of left field. So for us, just after 100 days from launch, 9-11 happened. And we're a travel company. So you can imagine... Nobody flew for months. Nobody. Uh, now, if we had had a bunch of TV running and radio, you know, we might have gone out of business. But the fact that we picked a different approach that you know, was e-commerce based, we could turn it off in an instant, we could pull back, we could preserve cash, hunker down and get through, uh, I think was part of the success of the company. And when travel did come back, we were then well positioned. Interesting. How does, by the way, just on a side note, how did Steve then break through the clutter as like the 45th with Kayak? Like how do you? User experience. I think that what, what Steve and his founding CTO did better than anybody is really have a, a great command of user experience. And Steve realized, I think, from his days at Orbitz, where we invented that single view of an entire market uh, in you know, one screen, he realized the, the power of engaging with customers in a very simple and intuitive way. And so uh, I think that you know, time and again throughout uh, the history of the internet, Companies like Apple and Uber and Kayak that have been able to take an incredibly complex problem and just simplify it and make it easy. Uh, they've won again and again and again. And so I think that Steve had a great insight uh, into that and the, the Kayak user experience is second to none. Um, so it's interesting. So Orbit says a great alumni group of which you're one of the leading, leading stars. We have so many successful companies yeah. both here and around the country. Um, but one thing you hear sort of continually from Orbitz people is, is that um, you know, the airline birth was a great one and yeah. we were awesome at that. 
but in a lot of ways, um, there was a bigger there was a bigger right. opportunity, even a, an even bigger opportunity. Yeah. Um, talk about the strategic insight behind that, because clearly everybody would want to orbits like home run. At the same time, um, there are some interesting insights strategically right. when you look at markets that people probably could learn from. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I think that Orbitz became a billion dollar company. Amazing, right? You know, far less than one tenth of one percent of, of all startups ever get to that size. I mean, one hundredth of one percent. Mm -hmm. uh, so they had a unicorn outcome. But if you look at the two companies, that won 20 years later. It was Priceline and Expedia. It wasn't Travelocity, it wasn't Orbitz. Ironically, Travelocity and Orbitz both got bought by Expedia. Uh, and what, what was the difference? The difference was that early on, at the same time that we were going after at Orbitz, the airlines and Travelocity was going after the airlines, Priceline and Expedia expanded their offerings and went hard after hotels. And there was tremendous margin upside in a hotel and purchase. And talk about why that is. There's an interesting dynamic that I think yeah. helps people look at two-sided marketplaces and compare and contrast the why it would not exist in airlines and why it does exist in hotels. I think it's helpful. So, I mean, hotel, the hotel industry is really, really interesting <laughs> because at the end of the day, it's one of those categories where uh, if a room goes unoccupied, it's completely, you know, lost opportunity. And so uh, you can never recapture that revenue from the night before if the room is unoccupied. So obviously the, the trick is try to price to Although fill every very room. Much like, very much like the airlines do. Right, exactly. The difference is with the hotel industry, they came up with a new business model that the airlines um, uh, you know, don't really use, and, and that is to pre-buy at a lower price, but basically lock in by, by prepaying for the inventory. So it's called merchant pricing. Uh, but basically, Expedia and Priceline pioneered this idea where they would negotiate lower prices with the hotels and the promise of selling a lot of that inventory very early on in the cycle. So the hotels would have a level of confidence going into the future that they had demand. They already had uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, rooms accounted for. So there was a really nice symmetry there where the hotels were getting demand filled up. Not the last minute business travelers, how but, but how Expedia could capture tremendous uh, margin and how, how as well. How centralized is, are the decisions to put in post inventory at hotels? Is it how much of that is done at Hyatt corporate versus at individual? You know, I think properties? that it, it's it's chain by chain. You know, some of them are run by management groups or an individual right. hotel it's property, more fragmented, and some isn't of them it? are corporate. And because of the fragmentation, you can get a lot of pricing power as an aggregator. Right. Um, but the other thing that Expedia was essentially doing in having this insight uh, is that they, they were able to create margin or, or, or you know, essentially arbitrage the price between what sure. you know, the hotel was willing to accept and what they were able to command so, in the marketplace. So, so very creative in that you have the arbitrage and <clears throat> the market dynamics are kind of the opposite of the airlines, right? The airlines, right. there are seven of them or nine of them. Right. And they sort of lived in mortal fear. That's why they founded Orbitz. Right. Now they there are hundreds of thousands of hotels. You right. almost have infinite choice. And the and the wasn't that part of the fear of the airlines was we want to make sure no, there's never an aggregator who gets power over us. Exactly, exactly. And so Orbitz was founded to keep that balance in the market. But back to your original point, I think that it, you know also looking back, our roots as an airline funded and founded company, we had a different mission than ultimately Priceline and Expedia had. Priceline and Expedia found the gap in the market with a lot of margin, a lot of upside. They could run hard against that. We had different obligations as a company at Orbit. We had an amazing outcome, but we're not yeah. worth tens and tens of billions of dollars like those companies well, are. Well, if, if, you know, you might be living in Hawaii on your own island instead Don't of running Signal. So yeah. it's, we're glad to have you running Signal. Well, it's good you. for Chicago. Um, so talk about why you left Orbitz, when you left Orbitz, and, and what you went to go do next. So, uh, so it was an amazing run at Orbitz with, uh, with amazing folks. Um, we had uh, an IPO, a sale descendant, a sale to Blackstone. So we had three changes of control in three years. Uh, and, you know, it was time. So, uh, so I pulled the trigger, uh, left the company after an amazing run, 
uh, and wanted to really broaden my experiences uh, as an operator. So I had left Orbitz as the chief operating officer, was able to broaden from my marketing roots with product responsibility and customer service and operations. Uh, but what didn't I have? It was the financial side of things. It was being an investor, walking in the shoes of somebody that really had to focus on the numbers uh, and make uh, the investment decision at the end of the day. And so I was very, very lucky to find an opportunity with the Pritzker Group to join them for a couple of years and learn the other side of the business. Um, and as, was it New World back then, or was it Pritzker? Well, so it's, so it's both. So I was on the, the Pritzker Group side, which is the private equity side, and the venture side used to be called New World Ventures. So All you're, one big family, though. Yes, exactly. Literally and figuratively. Yeah. <laughs> so you're, you're there working with JB at the Pritzker Group, yeah. and, and uh, uh, someone tracks you down, and Mark Kibben tracks you down, to run an idea by you yeah. um, that ended up being a really uh, pivotal moment yeah. in um, both your own professional career and um, the Chicago tech scene. So talk a little bit about um, Mark and that meeting yeah. and sort of the, what happened. So Mark is an amazing entrepreneur. Uh, Mark Kiven came up with the idea for Signal but before that, he had always been on an airplane working for other great tech companies in the advertising technology space. But they were always on the West Coast or the East Coast. They were never here in Chicago. So he was part of the early teams at amazing success stories like Avenue A, Atlas, Wright Media. Uh, but he had never done it here in Chicago. And he had an idea for Signal. Uh, it was, uh, I thought, a great idea. He took it to me. And he said, look, you're an investor. Would you invest in this idea? And I said, not only would I invest in it, how about I join you? Uh, and so we took the idea And how would you describe JB. the idea back then at that moment? In time? So we looked at the administrative problem, the original catalyst, the thing that 30,000 companies are using our software today so for. So to a layperson back yeah. in 2010. So if you think what? about my job at Orbitz as chief marketing officer, I probably had 15 to 17 different technology platforms that I had to manage. So I had to send data to analytics platforms and bidding platforms for Google and my display platforms and SEO, on and on and on. And the, the layer of technical complexity to get one website and one consistent set of data to all of those companies was really complex and burdensome and drove my IT department crazy, but also uh, got to a point where it was starting to slow down the website experience itself. You know, the, 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 the core site, uh, Orbit, was running more slowly because it had to load all of this software in the background. Uh, so Mark had the insight, he's like, let's build software that takes the burden off of the website and the IT teams, moves it off-site into a control UI where you could deploy different technologies more effectively, get out from And could the, the marketers deploy it? Exactly, get out from under the burden of working with IT and directly manage the software that you were deploying. So this is the original idea for the company. Uh, and our third founder, our technical uh, co-founder, Eric Lunt, loved that idea. He said, why should you have to load all this software in the background and slow all these sites down, create you know, not only performance issues, but governance issues, privacy issues? Why not move all of that burden to the cloud? Uh, and we pick up the data once, we connect it through the cloud to many folks. And so that original idea and in insight for the company, uh, we patented, uh, Eric, and his team of great technologists built our platform off of. And still to this day, it's the same platform that we're using to drive uh, the performance of the company. Now, what's different today? More channels. We started just with web. Now you can connect to any channel. Mobile devices, call centers, point of sale systems, ultimately television, it doesn't matter to us. If it's a digital signal, we can ingest it. We can also get a sense of who you are. If you authenticate, we can map across all of those engagement points. So one of the are. hardest things. But it's the for, same code base. So one of the hardest things for startups is, you know, you hear a lot of people come in with a 
grand vision of all the things they can do. And they've got, it makes a lot of sense. As an yeah. investor, you'll say, oh, that, is that a good idea? It seems like a good idea. I mean, the hard part is, how do you get those initial customers? Right. Particularly in B2B, where once you have them, it's incredibly valuable and, and you can get a lot of strong traction. But it can be incredibly hard to get an organization to say, I want to go do something different. You know, yeah. a lot of, um, I was at a 1871 board meeting and someone was saying, we should get J.P. Morgan to work with all these companies. And we looked at it and you say, you know, J.P. Morgan's not the right first customer. Their mm -hmm. reliability and rules and regulation and everything they have to have to be J.P. Morgan does not lend itself to putting something, a startup, you know, bubble, you know, it was just the right. early days of putting things together to put it in their, in their technology stack. Yeah. So that's true for any company. And of course, you know, it's great when you've got all the big names around you, but you got to yeah. get those first names. So talk about how, how did you get those initial first names? What were some of the challenges in getting them to sort of be the first to jump and, and, and what ended up working for you? So uh, I think that we had uh, a couple insights and then uh, my, my co-founders did the rest. You know, so uh, Eric had a history of building bulletproof scale technology. Uh, and so we had the, the, the technical credentials to walk into a large complex organization and play with the big dogs in the IT group mm -hmm. uh, and be legit. But Mark, uh, you know, is a, is a fearless chief revenue officer who, you know, set his sights on, honestly, owning his hometown. And credit to the Chicago community to step up and really supply a lot of our uh, initial early customers. I think Sears signed first, Orbitz, a little bit of an inside job, signed second. Uh, but if you look at our Chicago-based customers, right. you know, like, uh, like Cars and Crate and Granger and Allstate, the Chicago community really rallied around us and stepped up big time to provide us with the referenceable customer base to expand. And do you think if you were, I say this as a thought exercise, if you were out of Indianapolis or um, Cleveland or New York, you could have gotten the Chicago companies to do that? Or do you think being in Chicago was an important piece? I, I, you know what? I, I think that it's important. Proximity mattered as a startup because you could get in a cab or get in a car and be face to face repeatedly. It wasn't the sort of thing where you were on a phone. We could be at, at Hoffman. We could be at Craig. So do, you, so do you think that, I mean, clearly you have the technology that's yeah. certainly you could get better technology if you're in the valley, but if you, um, you know, San Francisco doesn't have that same breadth of companies you described. Do you think Chicago was an advantage to you versus being in the valley early on for those early customers? For us, certainly it was. I, mean, I think that Chicago offered us proximity to these amazing uh, advertisers, but also uh, we had the courage to go as a you know five, six, seven person company and present ourselves to those to those same companies and legitimately solve a problem that they had. That's great. So you went, you went international fairly early yeah. on. Talk about what you were thinking, why that, that idea. Um, so when Mark first brought the idea to me that we should expand national, uh, internationally, of course, I thought he was crazy. Um, but I've also realized over time that a consistent theme in being a successful entrepreneur is that everybody else thinks you're crazy. Because <laughs> uh, if everybody else thought it was a good idea, they'd all do it. Mm -hmm. um, so Mark said, let's go international. Let's go enter uh, the UK market. I've done it before at some of my other marketing technology companies. We can do it here. Uh, and you know, he got on a plane and did it. Now look, life is about being smart and lucky and various combinations at various times. So uh, Mark had the courage and the smarts to go uh, and enter the UK market and use his contacts and his Rolodex to do it. But we also got lucky. We found uh, a company that had built uh, a similar technology to ours. Uh, and they called us out of the blue one day and they said, I'd like to buy our company. So we're a two-year-old startup in Chicago. Sure, let's go do an international acquisition. Why not? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so we bought... Uh, a highly successful but small company, you know, that was adjacent to ours, basically a similar piece of software in that market. But what they had 
done really, really well was establish a customer base of about 25 really great customers. And so we were able to enter the market with some scale uh, using an acquisition as the entry strategy. And, and what do you see as the advantages of having gone international? And any downsides? Well, I mean, the, the phone calls at 1 o'clock in the morning with folks that, you know, are saying, hey, it's the middle of my day. That's always a bummer. But um, uh, And I think last time I talked to you, you, were, you just got off a flight from Australia, and I think you're heading to Singapore, Japan, next, the next week. I, I, I did fly a lot this year, uh, more so than, than I have. How many miles? Uh, close to 250,000. 250,000 miles. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You do like to work. You do love to I, work. All I know is that American Airlines small business unit came through and, and did a photo shoot with me for their, <laughs> I swear to God. And like they showed up, Carrie is with me today for our community. It's like American Airlines wants to come and do a photo shoot. I'm like, uh, okay. Uh, I must have tripped some horrible threshold where I just traveled too much. Um, uh, and, and the sad thing is that Mark's got me doubled. Really? Yeah. I think that literally the airlines probably throw rose petals when he walks through the... Wow. The, the airport. So you guys are like your own giant c travel company by yourself. I mean, it's incredible. Tell the airlines that. Seriously. Yeah, because we need all the love that we can get. Seriously. So. Uh, um, but, but international yeah. has been incredible for us. Here, here, here's the thing that uh, I think as companies in the U.S., because the U.S. is such an amazing market, uh, you can build an incredibly successful business here. But you know what? Most people don't live here. It was, it, was, it was funny, I was, I was in a meeting uh, in Singapore and I was meeting with a company uh, that did business throughout the region. And I said, how many customers do you serve? And they said, oh, we have a half a billion customers. <laughs> a half a billion customers, that's incredible. I was talking to a, 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 an agency that does business in China. And they said, do you know how many people on a daily basis are on the internet in China? I don't know. Yeah. Like, something like 800 million people. Uh, so it, so there's a yeah, big no, world out there, and they all need software to run their sites. Right. But the other thing is that in many markets, they're much more advanced technically hmm. than we are in the U.S. Why, do, why is that? I think they missed the whole desktop era. You know, they, the, the internet came late in a good way. So it's the leap Bandwidth is higher. Um, it's a more connected economy. People you know, have multiple mobile devices. It's just uh, many, many markets are more forward leaning uh, because they, they missed you know, the first 10 or 15 years. Of the, you know, there is no concept of dial up. They just went right to you know, LTE. Interesting. So obviously to have all this growth, you had to really um, have some funding. I think it's been reported you've raised yeah. about $50 million. Yep. Yep. Just quickly talk a little bit about um, some of those headlines. I want, I want to, there's some great questions here, and thank you for the voting on the questions. Really helpful. Um, what would you, uh, what, what were the sort of big funding moments in your, in your company history? Because you have some you have unusual ones, I think. Yeah, you know, I think that every startup that raises a lot of money, for the most part, has a, a, a little bit of a long and winding road from a a funding standpoint. Sure, everybody reads about the 50 unicorns that are killing it. I won't ask but you But not the question. other, you know, 15,000 companies that, you know, went, went a different path. So our, our first uh, round was led by, uh, you know, by the Pritzker Group and by JB, who believed in us very early on and put up the initial capital along with a couple other institutional investors, uh, you know, like the I2A fund here locally, uh, Tomorrow Ventures and, and Epic from out west. But most of the money in our first uh, three rounds came from right here in Chicago. So from that standpoint, we're a little bit different. We didn't go to the coast to get our funding. We actually got to stay at home. Uh, and look, I think that we had three experienced entrepreneurs that had all had successful exits. Uh, we were solving... I think uh, an important and complex problem. Uh, and we had an investor community here in Chicago that believed in us. Uh, uh, in our Series C, we added Baird Ventures. Uh, and Baird, you know, credit to Baird, uh, they had seen the Pritzker Group come in and, and I2A, and they really believed in the company. They knew that we were going to go out and go to the Valley. 
to raise money, and they preempted mm. us and said, hey, you know what? We'll hit your price. Let's just get it done. And I thought that that was you know, a, a lot of credit to the folks at Baird to believe in us and believe in Chicago's story and, and make, it, uh, make it work. Our last round uh, was a strategic round. So uh, back to international expansion, we found uh, an amazing business partner in Yahoo Japan, which is a completely separate company from Yahoo Inc. here. It's owned by SoftBank so owned, owned by SoftBank. It's, a, it's publicly traded. It's a completely separate company from Yahoo Inc. Hugely successful, growing like a it, weed. The ownership in Yahoo Inc. is one of its, uh, of yeah, 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 one yeah, of its yeah. more Yahoo valuable Inc. things. Has a, uh, most of the value in Yahoo Inc. comes from their investment in Yahoo Japan and Alibaba. Right. Um, so uh, Yahoo Japan is this incredibly successful juggernaut of a company in the Japan market, uh, and they uh, believed in our software from ver very early on, wanted uh, exclusive access to the software for the benefit of uh, an open digital economy in the Japan market. Uh, and so they approached us, uh, and through a series of, of uh, contracts, we got to know each other, trust each other, and then they led uh, our last round of investment. Uh, so it's and a that big round. Was really, it would be thirty million dollars. Thirty million dollar round. Uh, Yahoo Japan led, uh, and uh, you know credit to them. They believed in the company. They put their their money to work in our company, uh, and in turn, we've had incredible success in growing the business, in large part because of our partners at Yahoo Japan. That's great. So I want to get to everyone's questions, but yeah. um, one last thing, which is, what can this be in a decade? What could Signal be? What's the vision? Well, you know, I think that the, the hyper-connected consumer uh, isn't going away. In fact, that problem's growing every day. The signals that connect us to our digital selves are becoming more and more disparate. So the problem, the core problem of identifying who you are and connecting your signals uh, wherever you are at any time, that problem is becoming exponentially harder every year. So the white space that, that you know, the problem that we're solving isn't getting smaller, it's getting bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that the future for us is really, really bright. But the, uh, the other thing that we have going for us is that this trend, while important here in the States, is truly a global trend. So there are many, many more countries out there uh, outside of the countries that we're already in where we can go provide our services and continue to grow. So I think that Signal in 10 years uh, is helping to solve these problems in new media. I truly believe, and by the way, I've been saying this since 1988, that television will ultimately be addressable, that the way that we receive ads and things like mobile devices and, and uh, on the web will be the same way that you can address folks in television. We already have that in radio. Uh, we'll eventually have it in outdoor. So there's a whole world, hundreds of billions of dollars of spend that can become more relevant, more personalized, and it needs an engine to do that. Fantastic. Well, exciting. The, uh, we had some great voting here and some great questions. So I want to start with the, uh, do you think formal training and management or entrepreneurship is important to being successful for people to take you seriously? Huh. Um, it's kind of the should I go to business school question. Um, so, uh, so when John Slawney approached me to go to business, to go to Kellogg, he threw the application on my desk. I was at Leo Burnett and he said, let's go to Kellogg and meet women. So I, I, I'd love to say that my inspiration was, you know, to round out my, my, uh, you know, experience in, uh, uh, you know, in, in executive functioning, but it was really something far different. <laughs> By the way, I met my wife on my first night in my first class on my first day at Kellogg. So, so. it worked. And, and I'm totally task oriented, so it made <laughs> sense, right? Uh, and we're happily married ever since. But um, uh, I, I actually think that, that business school can be incredibly helpful because we all start out, uh, I think, for the most part, in a defined function. I'm a technologist, I'm a finance person, I'm a marketer. Most people get their start by doing something really, really well and advance within that track. Mm -hmm. But how do you get this broader view? And that's why you go to business school, is to meet people and get experiences that broaden you. That's great. So 
Uh, how do you make sure that your company focuses on your employees and customers while going through hypergrowth? It's 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 really really hard. I, I think that um, again, you don't always get it right. I think that the there's a couple lessons. One is, and, and I saw this firsthand at Orbitz. You know, the people that were right for the company when it was 50 people weren't necessarily right or happy at the company when it was 500 people. Uh, and so not everybody enjoys that growth curve. Some people love the small, uh, you know, amazingly spirited companies. I look at our marketing organization at Signal. We had an amazing, amazing marketer to help us launch Signal and Tracy Halpern. Tracy didn't want to be at the company when it was over 30 people. She's like, I'm out of here. Uh, I'm going to go help the next five small companies become big companies. And now we have a new head of marketing in Kathy who's amazing that came out of a larger organization and thinks we're small and quaint because we only have 150 people. So I think that uh, finding folks that are appropriate for the right stage of the company is important uh, and being really, really transparent with uh, the team about the change that you're going through. The product that we sold in the beginning of the company is different than the product that we sell today. Uh, and that level of communication and transparency, I don't always do a good job on. I think the executive team doesn't always do a good job of. But it's something we do have to take very, very seriously. Uh, and it's not easy. Uh, because I guarantee you, uh, you know, 99% of the companies that grow to be our size, uh, what they sold in the beginning isn't what they're selling today. So taking people on that journey of growth is important. Great. Uh, any book recommendations? <laughs> Who has time to read? 250,000 uh, <laughs> miles. Uh, um, you know what? I, I, you know what I love to, to, to read, honestly, is I'm just a massive consumer of news. Uh, you know, so every day, the journal, the Times, the Tribune, um, you know, on and on and on. That, to me, uh, is my reading. Um, I'm not a big sort of self-help business guy, and I <laughs> hate fiction. I'm a, I'm, uh, you know, I like, I like bio, uh, biographies. That's kind of been my thing throughout. So I'm trying to think of the last biography I read. Might have been three years ago. Uh, uh, well, you know, this, this, is, it's, this is too perfect for this. I think it was about Rockefeller. Oh, perfect. Yeah, see? yeah exactly. It was called Titan. It was about oh, yeah, it was a, a thousand a pages. One. It's a great book. Yes. Uh, and, and talks about the funding of University of Chicago. Oh, incredible. And, you know, all the amazing things that he did with social uh, entrepreneurialism. And the tension of him, of, of him backing, an entre backing the founding guy and the tension between that. Was well, totally. And, and he was an amazing entrepreneur. But what I think is really fascinating is to watch social uh, entrepreneurialism and also how uh, today's billionaires like Mark Zuckerberg are giving back. Well, who figured all that out? and came up with the original idea to give away all their wealth, it was Rockefeller. That's right. And so you, I, I think that you can, you can tie a lot of the life lessons about today's most successful executives back to some of his life experiences. That's a great point. Um, in the modern day when everybody and their mother is starting a startup, um, how do you find a competitive edge in founding a new company, given the sort of clutter out there, so to speak? Uh, you know, I sort of flippantly said this earlier, but I think it's so true. You have to, as an entrepreneur, believe passionately in something that everybody else thinks is stupid. Uh, and if you do that, and you're right, you can be amazingly successful, because you'll have the white space to operate and build a company. I remember uh, when, um, uh, when uh, Grubhub was being founded, you know, and Loney was saying, oh, you know, we're going to go aggregate every menu in America and put it online. And I'm like, good luck with that. And, and uh, of course, you know, five years later, he's like, hey, we did it. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, that I, I remember the first time, and I was a, a, the chief marketing officer at Orbitz at the time, the guys from Facebook came through. So we were the, one of the largest uh, online advertisers, spent a tremendous amount of money. And uh, the initial sales rep came and called on us. And I turned to my head of e-marketing after he left. And I go, that is the dumbest idea I've <laughs> ever seen in my life. Like, they're on 10 college campuses. They have no traffic. I go, if you're going to 
nobody in college has any money, let alone can travel. I don't know why they're here. And by the way, if you're going to be on 10 college campuses, go to Alabama and Michigan, where there's at least 50,000 people. Don't go to the Ivy Leagues. Like, what is this? And of course, I was wrong. That's right. So, <laughs> Looks like he landed on his feet. Yeah, exactly. Um, so how do you differentiate your company in technology to make sure you're always a market leader and make it affordable? I, you know, it's, it's a, it, there's no magic to this. It's, it's being, I think, just really self-aware uh, and being able to move with the market. Uh, I think that there's a, a long history of companies that haven't been self-aware haven't been willing to change and evolve with the market trends. And, you know, some of them got into trouble. You know, we talked about some of them eventually went bankrupt. Big, big businesses we talked about earlier. Um, uh, but then you look at other, you know, transcendent companies like Apple that have been constantly able to reinvent themselves by putting their old lines out of business. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's that level of self-awareness to say, hey, Maybe we need to overbuild what we were doing before. Maybe we need to keep evolving. It's really, really hard. We're not perfect at it, uh, and I think most companies aren't because it, it requires a level of self-awareness that ultimately is hard when you're in the bubble. So a uh, question here about networking. Would you consider yourself a good networker? Off and on. I, 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 I'm much better now, uh, but it's, it's, it's also a time constraint. You know, I loved my days on the investing side, because I could meet people and hear their stories, like tonight. Uh, uh, and you do, when, when you're in an entrepreneurial environment uh, where you're working you know, with a team in a bubble uh, like we are, it's hard to network, but even more important than that you make time available to meet with people and do that. And do I do it all the time? No. Do I enjoy it when I can? I love it. Um, is it absolutely necessary to, to get experience in big and small companies before starting out on your own? Oh, you know, I think this is, this is a really interesting. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, so what I tell, you know, tell folks that ask me this, that, that are, are younger and have the, the choice, so I said, it's, it's, it's easier, I think, I have no evidence for this whatsoever, but, but Intuitively, I think it's easy to start off in a bigger company, you know, get that on your resume. I worked at, you know, Miller Coors. I worked at Google. I worked at uh, Accenture. And, and check the box and say, wow, you know, from a resume standpoint, I had this really amazing experience at a big, sophisticated, well-known company. And then I went small. I think just from a getting a job standpoint, it's sometimes hard to reverse that and start in a series of small companies and then wake up one day, whether for, for want uh, or, or, or desire, and say, now suddenly I'm going to go work at a giant company. But I think it's easier to, to flip that. I also know that, that young people today believe that they're going to work at 10 or 15 companies throughout their career. So it almost doesn't matter in many ways and that they can move around. That's great. Um, what gave you the courage to start something on your own, and how did you know it was the right time? I think that, that from a, uh, it's an incredibly personal decision, uh, because you have to be all in as an entrepreneur. Uh, I know that as, as, a, as a founder, I didn't pay myself for a year. Wow. You know, Mark didn't pay himself. Uh, so you have to be at a certain life stage. You either have to be really young and you know, ramen is cool, and you're, you know, you got an apartment, and you're good, uh, or you've reached a point where, you know, uh, uh, you, you know, you can do it. You can afford to do it. You can afford to take a risk. Uh, I'm lucky in that I have an amazing wife uh, who's got a great career, uh, and I can go off and do crazy things like this. But for everybody, it's situationally dependent, uh, and ultimately, you have to decide you're ready to take a risk, both financially and most importantly, emotionally. So, um, you know, it's interesting, uh, entrepreneurs, people want to be entrepreneurs, they think about being an entrepreneur, there's the, one of the questions, that, the last question I'll ask before we go to our wrap-up questions is, um, people have a hard time with this one. It's this idea that I want to be a founder, I want to be an entrepreneur, but I don't have an idea, at mm. least yet. And you hear different conflicting things on this, I, you know, I certainly know that um, you know, in my experience, we have a very clear set of track record on 
one path versus the other. But I'd be interested to hear your, um, your, your advice to someone asking this question and your thoughts on it. So look, we're, we're, Signal's a great example. You know, Eric and I didn't have the idea Mark did. Uh, but we each brought something different to the table. I think that one of the most uh, amazing things about places like 1871 is that folks with different skills can come together uh, and take an idea that one person has, but the combination of talents around the table take it to another level. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't necessarily have to be the, uh, the, the person that has the genesis of the idea to help make that idea successful. Now, uh, the three of us as co-founders, I think, uh, uh, were self-aware enough to know, hey, we bring different things to the table, let's kind of divide and conquer. Uh, and, and that's a life lesson in and of itself. Good. Uh, there was one more related to that, which is, um, is it better to start something on the side um, mm. or, uh, just immediately or to go do it or to wait till you really feel like you've got the idea kind of fitting together, working right? I, again, I think that this is all about your personal circumstance. I know people that have done both. I think that ultimately... Um, being an entrepreneur means you have to be literally all in. You know, it is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, and if you're not sort of emotionally ready to commit, uh, I think that you can only take it so far. Uh, now, that's not to say that you, you can't get the idea off the ground, you can't get an MVP, you can't be ready to go. But when you're ready to go all in, I think that you're ready to be an entrepreneur. Um, and what's your view on Chicago today for entrepreneurs, well, for starting It's amazing. Uh, there's never been a better time. Uh, we not only have uh, a community of previously successful entrepreneurs, which I think is important, you know, the Orbitz alumni being some of them, I think Groupon will be an amazing catalyst, uh, and then some of the more recent successes. But now we have the capital and investment structure to support it. Uh, we have great universities supplying talent. We have a government and the mayor uh, that is really supportive of the tech community. So there's never been a better time uh, to be a technologist and to start a tech company uh, than here in Chicago today. So uh, was it always like this? Not at all. I mean, for those of us that have been here for 20 plus years and have seen the scene evolve, uh, we know how special a time it is right now. And the fact that we got a full room and a full 1871 and they're knocking out the ceiling and building upstairs is credit to the fact that we have something special here. Well, you've got something special with uh, your experience at Orbitz, your experience with Signal, and building a great company. Thank you for sharing it with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.